Welcome to the Cats Links Blue Line Public Art Tour. The Lynx is a 15-station light rail line that runs 9.6 miles from Uptown Charlotte to the intersection of I-485 and South Boulevard. You will find art integrated at every station of the Lynx Blue Line that is intended to provide a unique experience for the transit user, whether they ride the line daily or only on special occasions. On this tour, you will learn about the art and the 13 artists who were inspired to make Charlotte's light rail line a ride unlike any other. This tour will involve both walking and riding, so please follow the safety regulations that are posted in the light rail vehicle and on the station platforms. You will need a round trip or one day ticket which can be purchased from ticket vending machines on the station platform or online at www.ridetransit.org. You will begin the tour at the 7th Street Station and end at the I-485 and South Boulevard Station. Feel free to pause the tour at any time if you would like more time to view a specific artwork. The entire tour will take approximately two hours. Please check the Lynx Blue Line schedule before you begin at www.ridetransit.org. Let's get started. This tour begins on the platform of the 7th Street Station, located between the Bank of America parking garage and Imagine On. Standing on the southbound platform, you can see art by three different artists. Look across the tracks to the passenger shelter. Area artist Sean Cassidy has designed the etched glass of the windscreen and the mosaic column cladding. He also created the leaves in the fence between the tracks. The veins of each leaf have been replaced by a street map of the area surrounding the station. Placed at different angles within the fence, the leaves bring to mind eroded foliage blowing down the platform. The implied movement and the altered skeleton of the leaves gives transit users a way to contemplate change in relationship to both nature and the city of Charlotte. You will experience more of Cassidy's leaves featured at nine other stations on the line and in the light rail vehicle. All leaves are native to the area. Listen to the artist describe what inspired his art that is now providing you with an experience. Uh, one of the experiences that influenced my work for the Blue Line in the most um, significant way was um, a walk. I went on with my wife in Lansford Canal State Park in South Carolina. And on that walk, I found a, a leaf, an eroded leaf, where all of the, the meat of the leaf had been eroded and just the, the skeletal veins of the leaf were left. And I picked this leaf up and, and took it home, put it on my desk and set it next to a, by pure accident, by next to the map of the, um, of the, of the stations where Katz was proposing that uh, sculptures be built. And there was an incredible visual similarity between the characteristics of the leaf and what a map looked like. I was deliberately trying to make use images that would be accessible to everybody. So a leaf, everybody has some understanding of trees and leaves and some association or memory of, of interacting with trees and leaves. So that was the starting point. And then within that, that idea, I tried to make it a more layered experience. So for example, in the, in the leaves in the fence, the leaves in the fence represent both growth and decay, with the green being growth and the, the skeletal veins being decay. And the veins in the leaves also represent maps around the community. So it's a kind of layered experience. Some people will just see leaves. Some people will see growth and decay. Some people will recognize that it's a map. And it may take several times on the light rail to actually penetrate those three ideas. Next to the passenger shelter, you will see a bench by Asheville artist Haas Haley, titled River Rock. You will see four more of his benches later in the tour. At both ends of the station, cast in the low concrete walls that separate the light rail tracks from the platform, called a cheek wall, is a bas-relief that continues the use of the ginkgo leaf. There are 47 bas-reliefs throughout the system depicting ginkgo, hornbeam, and skyrocket oak leaves. 
These 16-inch reliefs transform an abundant material in the light rail system, concrete, into a unique element at every station, and the relief is cast by using a rubber mold provided by the artist. The artist, Alice Adams, who is from New York City, was influenced by the Charlotte Tree Canopy and designed her reliefs and other elements in homage to the Charlotte Arboretum, or Place of Trees. Now, turn right and follow the sidewalk to the CTC Arena Station. You will cross over both 6th Street and 5th Street before you arrive at the station. Press pause until you are standing on the station platform. When you arrive at the CTC Arena Station, you are surrounded by the work of well-known public artist Andrew Lester. His work at this station, together with his work at Time Warner Cable Arena, create an environment made up of several elements that are united by a common theme, the history of the textile industry in Charlotte. First, look down at the platform. The bold pattern under your feet is the zigzag reverse twill weave that Lester discovered in the American Cotton Handbook. The artist translated the traditional weaving pattern into a grid for six inch concrete pavers as a tribute to the hardworking mill employees of the textile industry in Charlotte. The long and narrow platform is an ideal site to display the pattern. Locate the designated pedestrian crossing at the north end of the tracks. Carefully cross over the tracks to the other side of the station. When you are there, look over the railing at Time Warner Cable Arena Plaza. Looking east from the platform, you can see another work by Lester in Time Warner Cable Arena Plaza. He was commissioned by the Arts and Science Council to design the four brightly colored ceramic and brick towers called Flying Shuttles in 2005. Walk left to the end of the platform and down the ramp. Then turn right and go down the stairs into the plaza of the arena to get a better view of flying shuttles. Lester also created 23 glazed ceramic sculptures incorporated into the facade of the arena. Turn right again. Stop when you are standing underneath the light rail bridge. Here, Lester designed the brick cladding for the six support columns of the light rail bridge over Trade Street. Using three colors of brick, the artist created patterns and shapes reminiscent of bobbins of thread, an artifact from the textile industry. The artist talked about the importance of using a common theme at the light rail station and in the plaza. Well, I think that one has to think of one aspect of public art is it usefulness in, in um, knitting disparate things together. It has, a, it has a kind of urban design function. So when, for instance, when one gets to the Trade Street station, you look out over the railings and you see the flying shuttles. And so there's a kind of an environment that is being created there, a spatial environment with these, with these little uh, objects that are very, very, uh, if you will, independent and quite unique but they all come they're a family of forms that are connected in terms of their theme and i think uh and by that sense they claim a whole space and that space becomes um, if you will infused with the kind of um, intention of those works and the theme of those works Cross under the bridge and take the elevator on your right up to the station. 
pause the tour until you are once again standing on the southbound platform. When you are back on the station platform, you will find Sean Cassidy's cottonwood leaf in the fence between the tracks. Look for the solid black dot to locate your present location in the street map that Sean has used to replace the veins of the leaf. Now look to your right, and you will see that there is a sidewalk all the way to the next station. Walk toward the 3rd Street and Convention Center station. Pause the tour until you are standing under the translucent green canopies of the 3rd Street platform. Welcome to 3rd Street and Convention Center Station. The artwork at this station is unlike any other station because, as you can see, the standard shelters have been replaced by 20 brightly colored sculptural canopies. These canopies were designed by well-known public artist Jody Pinto. Titled Light Station, each of the green and berry-colored fiberglass canopies and benches are transparent. At night, when lit from within, or when light from the sun filters through during the day, the transit rider is surrounded by a dramatic glowing landscape. Pinto also designed the paving pattern to complement the shadows cast by the glowing canopies. Light has always been a central factor in my work, uh, whether it's natural light or fabricated light. Um, it, light is something that uh, puts people on, on stage, in a sense. It, it awakens them. Uh, it, it makes them see and realize the surroundings around them in a, in a different way, depending on the time of day um, and depending on even the color of the sky. So as I was traveling around Charlotte and as I was thinking about what I wanted to do, I knew from the beginning that light was going to be a central factor for whatever I, I was going to design. Pinto said that she views public art as a theater and is intent on engaging the audience, providing drama, light, and props. The fiberglass material is a performing material with light from the sun and internal lighting that shoots down the hollow trunks of the canopies. As one of the busiest stations in Uptown, Light Station creates a dramatic link between passengers and the contemporary urban landscape and may cause them to contemplate the future of the city of Charlotte. Press pause until you board the next southbound train, but don't forget your ticket. When the train begins to move, press play. Now that you are inside the light rail vehicle, look up to the ceiling. This is another work by Sean Cassidy. Here, he continues his use of leaf shapes native to the area. The changing colors convey the four seasons, and the parallel lines suggest a sense of continuous movement. One of the things in my own work, I suppose, is I often try and make work that looks like it's undergoing some kind of change or, or um, transformation, so the leaves look like they're growing and they also look like they're decaying. And the ceiling graphic on the inside of the trains was deliberately designed to kind of reflect the changes of the season. So if you look up in the ceiling on the trains, the, the leaf pattern changes colors and the colors kind of correlate, in my thinking, from colors that would equate to spring, to summer, to fall, to winter. So as you move down the length of the train, it's almost as if you're moving through time and, and, and season. To create this art for the train ceiling, Cassidy produced an original work using a unique layered painting process he developed. I'd lay down layers and layers and layers of paint and then I put two layers or three layers of white paint on the top and then I take an electric sander and I sand through the layers of paint 
to reveal the drawing underneath. So it's almost like a reverse process of drawing. No, normally in drawing, it's an adding process where you make a mark on a piece of paper. And in my case, what I'm doing is, is a reversal of that. By taking away material, I'm actually making a mark. Now look down at the seats of the train, where Cassidy has designed a pattern fabric that reiterates the leaf theme of his other art. The overlapping leaves and the monochromatic palette create a soothing and unique pattern. These artworks are subtle, yet the artist has used them to create an experience for the rider that is far from ordinary. I would like viewers or riders on the trains to be momentarily disrupted by the artwork that they encounter on the light rail system. And by this I mean just momentarily taken to a different place. So when they see something on the ceiling or they see the fabric design or they see, you know, Thomas Sayers discs out the window, it just momentarily adds to the uh, excitement and curiosity of the day, I suppose, in a sense. So that often when you're riding on a train, you're just daydreaming or you're thinking about all the stuff you have to do. And these artworks, I think, are an opportunity for to be kind of taken outside of that line of thought and to think about something new that you might not have considered. As the train begins to move out of Uptown and across the I-277 bridge, you will pass by the Stonewall Station. Here, you will find another one of Sean Cassidy's leaf sculptures, Maple. The first station in Charlotte's South End neighborhood is Carson Station. Do not get off the train, but take a look out the window or the door and view the column cladding in windscreens designed by Leticia Huerta. The windscreens depict swirling waters and gold mining pans, while the column cladding shows intermittent flecks of gold in the mosaic tile. This gold mining imagery represents J.H. Carson, owner and operator of the Rudisil Gold Mine, which was located under Center City, Charlotte. In fact, the first documented gold discovery in the United States occurred only 25 miles from Charlotte, and at one point in time, the gold mining industry was the second most common employment in North Carolina. In 1835, Charlotte became the home to a branch of the United States Mint, producing over $5 million in gold coins before the Civil War. Continue riding south to the Bland Street Station. Pause the tour until you exit the train and are standing on the southbound platform. At Bland Street Station, you will notice the intricate patterns in the mosaic column cladding, platform paving patterns, and the etched glass windscreens designed by Leticia Huerta. The winding rose patterns on all three are inspired by floral fabrics and the Victorian architecture of homes in the surrounding South End neighborhood of Dilworth. Walk south to the end of the platform and turn right where you will see a low wall with a series of four small bronze sculptures by Washington, D.C. artist Yuriko Yamaguchi, titled Dream Keepers. The intentionally ambiguous shapes allow pedestrians walking by to wonder, is it a bird or an umbrella? Is it a flower or a musical instrument? The artist has called this project a visual riddle offering viewers an opportunity to use their imagination and create their own stories for these elusive but slightly familiar objects. 
As you turn to make your way back to the platform, you will find a water fountain that has much more to offer than a cool drink. New York artist Nancy Bloom created the sculptural drinking fountain basins for every Lynx Blue Line station. As you bend down to take a drink, you will see a Fibonacci spiral representing natural growth patterns. Bloom chose to include the blossom of the dogwood tree because it is the state flower of North Carolina. Cast in bronze, the basins will develop a rich patina over time. Return to the platform and carefully cross to the other side of the station to see another of Haas Haley's River Rock benches. Haley replaced five of the standard benches on the line with a hand-polished concrete version inspired by smooth stones found in the streams and rivers of North Carolina. The artist creates both a reason and a space for contemplation, focusing on comfort as a key element. Haley said that he wanted any part of the art to conform to the body in a way that was pleasing without dictating how one would sit on it. The familiar shape and the smooth finish provide an inviting place for passengers to sit while the organic form contrasts the symmetry and strong geometric lines of the station platform. Look in between the tracks to find another of Sean Cassidy's leaves, Pin Oak. Turn left and walk down the sidewalk to the East West Boulevard station. Press pause until you are standing on the station platform. When you arrive at East West Boulevard station, locate the stairs at the north end of the platform. Go down the stairs and look to your left down Camden Road. Here you will find a 360 foot wall featuring 33 mosaics by area artist Tom Thone. By laying out the mosaics in the shape of machine cogs, the artist makes a reference to the machinery of the textile mills. Please use caution as you walk along Camden Road to view this artwork. To create his mosaics, Thone used the Trancadis method, in which irregular shards of ceramics are reused for large mosaics. In order to collect materials for the art, Katz and the artist initiated a community collection, inviting Charlotte Mecklenburg residents to participate in the artistic process by donating their own whole or broken pieces of china glassware or ceramic pottery. The community responded enthusiastically by bringing their items to Thone Studio at McCall Center for Visual Art. When they came to donate, they also shared the stories and significance of each piece with him. By incorporating the collected materials into his designs, he preserved the personal stories of the community members who donated their treasures. From a wedding anniversary picnic plate that survived a fall from a Linville Gorge bridge to melted marbles from childhood, from blue willow dishes and even a sugar bowl that once held the ashes of a beloved grandfather, the memories of the community are intermingled with the history of the area that the wall as a whole outlines. There are cogs that honor the history of Charlotte from the Revolutionary War through the textile and tobacco industry and even to the present day development spurred on by the light rail. In addition to the community collection, there are also original pieces by local artists Terry Shipley, Patrick Robertson, and the late David Ray Chisholm. The artist also led workshops with students from Charlotte Montessori School, Trinity Episcopal School, and the West Boulevard YMCA, teaching them about mosaics and incorporating their original pieces into the wall. Watch for cars and carefully walk to the end of the wall, then turn left to return to the station platform.
As you walk, observe the paving patterns in the concrete, column cladding, and windscreens. Also designed by Leticia Huerta, they feature a depiction of the cotton plant. Cotton was a commonly grown crop in North Carolina and made this area ideal for textile manufacturing. Charlotte was home to many successful textile mills, including the Atherton Mill, in the South End, not far from where you are standing now. Where to research this historic industry and many of her designs are based on textile patterns. This particular design was based on an intricate quilt pattern that she found in a book about quilting traditions in North Carolina. Press pause until you board the next southbound train. Do not exit the train at the New Bern station, but as you pass by, be sure to notice the different shape of the pavers at the station. The leaf shapes used in the platform paving, mosaics, and etched glass windscreens are by Leticia Huerta, entitled Renewal. The three elements complement each other and create a living room effect and provide a sense of identity at each station. After you pass the New Bern station, the train will travel under an archway. This arch is actually the CATS vehicle maintenance facility. Every night when the trains stop running, they are brought here and are cleaned, inspected, and prepared for the next day. As you are approaching the Scaly Bark Station, you will be greeted by a work made up of six sculptural discs by North Carolina artist Thomas Sayer, entitled Furrow. This project was featured in several national art publications, including Sculpture Magazine, and was a Public Art Network Year in Review selection in 2008. Sayer was inspired by the shape of a harrow disc, an agricultural tool used to cultivate farmland. The title, Furrow refers to the cultivation trench, or V, left in farmland behind a plow. Each 18-foot tall disc is cast from Carolina Earth, weighs 11 tons, and is a monument to the agricultural past of the Scaly Bark neighborhood. The theme of the piece uh, came from experiences of living in the South, of knowing something about the development, the urbanization of the South, which was echoed uh, surprisingly, or, or not surprisingly, in, in a public meeting that was designed to, for the artist to hear something from the public. And at that meeting, there were actually several. But I heard from people who were, in essence, neighbors who remember when that area of Charlotte was plowed field. Um, and the concept of the piece came from that notion of once there were plowed fields right there within you know, yards, hundreds of yards of the Scaly Bark Station. And now there is light rail, which is all about uh, spawning density in urban environments where you want density to occur. When the artist proposed his project, he said, the implicit nature of the disc and their placement within the rapidly developing median of South Boulevard causes the viewer to think of, what are we farming now? And what does the light rail system mean to the future of Charlotte and to its history. Light Rail is cultivating this development. The work is intentionally speaking to the change in land use from rural to suburban and the ongoing relationship of the people to the land. Furrow was sculpted using the artist's original technique called earth casting in which the forms were created from Carolina earth reinforced with concrete and steel rebar and cast in the ground in proximity to where they will be permanently installed. The entire process took five months to complete including three months curing time where the sculptures were left to bake in the location that is now the park and ride lot. After the sculptures were dry, they were installed by lifting each disc out of the ground in one piece with a crane and placing it onto a 10-foot deep concrete footing. 
The artist created the texture of the disc by throwing rocks at the surface during the casting process. Do not exit the train, but when it comes to a stop at the station, take a look at the station platforms, column cladding, and windscreens. Designed by Leticia Huerta, the platform paving, the glass windscreens, and the mosaic column cladding patterns at this station resemble Mexican bingo cards. Influenced by the growing Hispanic population that lives around the Scaly Bark Station, as well as her own heritage, Huerta said that here she wanted to design art that would bridge the gap between two cultures. Each image has both English and Spanish text and she sees them as a teaching tool. She said that in her approach to public art, in every neighborhood you have to talk about something that relates to the people there. As you pass the Woodlawn Station, you will see more windscreens, column cladding, and platform paving by Leticia Huerta, titled Leaves, and another River Rock Bench by Haas Haley. Do not exit the train here, but look toward the parking lot to see a landscape designed by Alice Adams called Orchard. Alice Adams and Marek Reynes were two design team artists who worked with the Lynx Blue Line project team to develop an art plan for the light rail corridor. They identified a common theme of my place, my choice, my ride, my story, and laid out specific art opportunities for other artists throughout the line. Their involvement ensured a sense of continuity throughout the stations. It was Alice's deep interest in the local tree canopy that inspired an arboretum theme that you see echoed in many of the other artists' work. Arboretum means place of trees. By designing a site-specific landscape plan for the park and ride lot and concrete stamping and scoring on sidewalks and bus bays, Adams not only pays homage to the local tree canopy, she also activates the transitional space that the transit patron will pass through to access the station and creates a wayfinding system. An experienced public artist who has been working on transit design teams since 1985, Alice said that her goal in creating art for a transit system is to make interesting the spaces that most people will take for granted. Press pause until you arrive at the Tivola station. When you exit the train at Tivola Station, walk right and go down the stairs. As you walk down, you will see a sculpture nearly two stories tall entitled, Reconstructed Dwelling. This sculpture by Dennis Oppenheim is made of common home building materials and incorporates recognizable elements of a house, a set of stairs, a roof, walls, and windows. By reorganizing the known elements of a house and setting them above a floor plan of a typical home in the neighborhood, Oppenheim is challenging the viewer to rethink the conventional idea of home. The artist has said that this project is art becoming architecture and architecture becoming a stage. During construction of the station, the general contractor installed the piece using detailed plans and instructions from the artist. Dennis Oppenheim is a well-known public artist with work all over the United States, Europe, and South America. His work has been featured in exhibitions in Milan, Athens, Barcelona, New York, San Francisco, and Paris. Take the next southbound train to the next stop. Archdale Station. Pause the tour until you are standing on the station platform. Music 
After you exit the train at the Archdale station, locate the elevator at the south end of the platform. As you approach the end of the station, you will see the only art in an elevator on the Lynx Blue Line called Tower of Light. The artist, the late Richard C. Elliott, has been recognized for his large-scale installations using small plastic industrial reflectors. The work marks both a point of entry and exit to the Archdale Station platform. Ride the elevator down to the plaza under the platform. From inside the elevator, the 36 separate panels comprised of two layers of colorful industrial reflectors create the visual effect of stained glass as light passes through them. As you ride down the elevator and the patterns are revealed to you, you will experience a prismatic display of color, light, and motion. Some glass was intentionally left blank on either side of the elevator to give the rider a view of the surrounding landscape. Once you are under the platform on the plaza, look north toward the bridge and then south toward the long wall. Here you see two boldly contrasting colors on the bridge, columns, piers, and walls chosen by local artist Marek Reynas to create continuity throughout the line from Woodlawn Station to the I-485 and South Boulevard Station. He also chose the form liners that add texture to the retaining walls and bridge piers. The colors that Rainish chose are meant to reference the rich color of red Carolina earth and the blue-gray of the southern sky. Also on this plaza, Alice Adams has designed a sculptural concrete bench that incorporates a planter where the transit rider can rest and reflect. Go back up onto the platform and pause the tour until you have boarded the next southbound train. As the train moves south to our final stop on the tour, you will pass by the Arrowwood Station. Do not exit the train, but as you go by, take a look at the mosaics etched windscreens and platform paving. Also designed by Leticia Huerta, the patterns here are references to the Native American pottery of the Catawba Indians. The Catawba Indians were the original inhabitants of this area, living along the Catawba River between North and South Carolina. The black snake that you see coiled around the column cladding is one of the oldest images used in Catawba Indian pottery. The Catawbas historically tattooed the symbol on the shoulder blades of respected war captains. The next stop you will pass is the Sharon Road West Station. Do not exit the train here, but as you pass, look out the window at the large wall and bridge that surround the park and ride lot. Here, Marek Reynas chose a different form liner and color combination for over 25,000 square feet of wall. Here, the texture of the walls resembles tree bark and foliage, reiterating the Arboretum theme and complementing Alice Adams' butterfly circle landscape. Pause the tour until you reach the I-485 in South Boulevard Station. in South Boulevard Station is the final station on the Lynx Blue Line. At this station, you will find art by Leticia Huerta, Alice Adams, Nancy Blue, and Marek Reynas. 
Letitia Huerta responded to Sterling Elementary School that is in proximity to the station. The school's playing fields are actually located on the roof of the I-485 parking garage. Huerta visited Sterling Elementary School to involve the students in the station art. The graphic geometric shapes of the windscreens and the bright primary colors of the mosaics and paving patterns were inspired by children's playground games. Alice Adams influenced the design of the landscape on the sloping hill, deliberately complementing Huerta's station art. The best view of the landscaping can be seen from the pedestrian bridge at the south end of the station. I hope you enjoyed this tour of the Lynx Blue Line Public Art. You will conclude your tour here at the I-485 and South Boulevard Station. To return to the 7th Street Station, make sure that you have your round trip or one day ticket and board the next northbound train. This podcast was brought to you by the Charlotte Area Transit System Art and Transit Program. I am Katie Stegall, Art and Transit Program Assistant and producer of this tour. I hope that this tour has encouraged you to continue riding public transit and noticing the art that makes the Lynx Blue Line a ride unlike any other. To learn more about cats and public art, visit us on the web at www.ridetransit.org.